I think we can probably get going now since most everybody is in here and all. First off, uh, thanks for your, thank you guys for attending this class. I know there's a lot of choices to go through and hopefully if I do my job right, you guys can all leave here with a little bit more of an um, idea of how to generate some income with some cylinders onto it. Um, it's not the most exciting topic out there, but it is something which I'm assuming everybody in here being a dive show, you all have cylinders. And it is one of those sources which you can gain income from. But when I did some research, um, for those of you who maybe attended Brian's last course, a lot of data on where the money's coming from, and I did kind of the same thing onto it. But I might roll a little bit differently. Um, my background comes, many of you have been diving for well over 30 years, um, public safety dive team in charge of my dive locker. I foolishly got into the training side of things and owned, opened up a couple of dive stores. And that's where most of my data comes from as being a dive store owner and all the issues and the problems and the concerns that came up with that whole process onto it. Um, I've been teaching cylinder inspection programs for about 17 years. Um, I put the program together for SDI TDI. And when I put the program together for SDI TDI ERDI, I didn't base it upon the dive industry. Um, the dive industry is a limited market base. And when you go out there in the, in the cylinder world out there, there are multi millions of cylinders out there involved in fire. Um, beverage industry. My, my best example there, when I started to really get some eye openings, I went to a um, NFPA conference, National Fire Protection Association conference. When I went there, huge booth. Guys, they, were, they spent like $100,000 on one of their booths, which nobody was in, just to show their name at this place. And one of my tags to get them into my booth is it wander by me. I'd say, how many cylinders do you own? So that way at least I can get a conversation when I started talking to them. And most of them would walk by, I'd say, how many cylinders do you guys own? Did it at a dive store, pre, excuse me, a dive show previously, and I did it at fire shows. Oh, uh, we've got 50, we've got 100, we've got 150. At the NFPA conference, when I was asking most of those organizations, how many cylinders do you own? They would stop, 700,000. <laughs> how many are you in charge of? Uh, I think 150,000. Um, worldwide, I think we have over 1 million cylinders in, under our control. My next question to them was, well, who inspects them? How do you get to the process? And they went, we don't know. I talked extensively to a guy from, he ran Coca-Cola in Mexico and all their cylinders. And I said, so how many cylinders? He said, I had 750,000 cylinders. Okay, who inspects them? We don't really have an inspection process, but we need one. How many injuries do you have? He says, we have way too many injuries because people aren't inspecting our cylinders. He says, well, what do you guys do? It's like, well, we inspect cylinders. Like, well, we didn't know anybody was out there for that. So the beautiful thing about what I'm going through this program is to let you guys realize that yes, we have a market in the dive industry. We're used to it. It's been into our heads since Bill High started it 30 years ago. We need to be safe on to it and safety concerns. But what we've got to start doing is thinking outside the realm of scuba diving and what other areas do we have to go ahead and generate some income. And you guys have the knowledge base to go out there and do some of this training on your own. Um, <clears throat> when we go out there and you deal with somebody like Coca-Cola or a fire department and you say, here's your cylinders, they don't even want to touch them or fill them. They, they're all spooked by them. Yet we all in this room probably have filled hundreds, if not thousands of cylinders um, in maybe a couple of weeks or a month. It's no concern to us. We can do it all the time. But those industries don't want to even touch it. Um, another one of my markets is military. Um, had a guy come in, he was a diver, said, yeah, I've got, um, we got a compressor. It's like, okay, so he brought me in to do some, some teaching and instruction onto it. Found out, long story short, the government gave them $80,000 to buy a compressor, which they did. It was a beautiful piece of equipment. And they had cylinders they had to fill, but they were afraid to touch the on button. They had an $80,000 piece of equipment they didn't know how to operate, and they didn't know what to do with it, they didn't know how to go forth with it, and they were afraid to fill the cylinder because of the dangers involved with it. So they brought in me, and my background's in the diving industry, and I walked them through it, and now they can start to use that systems. Those are the markets I'm discussing here today, and hopefully give you guys some ideas to maybe expand your horizons onto it. So what I want to kind of cover today is the cost of filling the cylinders, how to reduce those costs, because that's a big part of it. The cylinders and the valves, how to do some basic inspections to increase some revenue generating there. Outside maintenance opportunities, outside trainings, and primarily what are the non-diving markets and how can you go and infiltrate them? I don't have an easy answer for that, by the way. How do you go out there and get Coca-Cola to go ahead and contact you to help them with the inspection process? It's a high corporate ladder, it's a difficult thing to do, but slowly we can break some inroads in and maybe somebody out there knows somebody who knows somebody else and then that might be an avenue for you. So I guess one question for you and hopefully I have somebody who wants to speak up. What do you guys charge for air fills? Just for an air fill, somebody comes into your shops. I'll look. Six? I charge 10. Anybody else in those range? So 
But the $6 range, and I'd probably say this, the one thing we've, we've heard about and has been pounded into our heads right now, one of our nemesis is the internet. And as you guys all well know, they can't do air over the internet. So here we, oh, is the internet. The internet is out there and, and we're competing. Yeah, they can't get it. So we, we have the one thing that a diver has to come into, yet what is the one thing that we aren't charging for? Air fills. And it is probably in patterned into our heads 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think it was a Southern California dive store, I know for certain. And what their statement was, if you buy a cylinder from us, and in fact, I take it back, it was actually one in the Northwest. If you buy a cylinder from us, you get free air for life with the hope they would come in and buy the product when they came in and do it. We have new changing times right now. People aren't coming to us to look for the products. They're going online and trying to find it. So one of the questions, what do we charge for an air fill? It's kind of cut off here. Um, so I guess in, out of on, how many, anybody in here use air fills as a s way to get this customers into the store to buy a product? Does anybody generate that saying, come on in and, which we have a couple stores in there, come on in and buy, and I guess I've tried the same thing. Does it doesn't work for me. When they come in, they'll come in, they'll get their free air fill, they're out the store. I might be lucky to get in the dry suit area, some zipper wax and all. Does it work for you? Did you have an, didn't you? Because they come, because what are they, who's coming into your store? Somebody who wants something for free. So what are they gonna buy from you? Nothing, because it's not free. They wanna go out and try to find something different on that. So that is something which we have to start to change our, change our mindsets on. So next in, um, so what I did is a little bit of research. What is the average price nationwide? Do you guys um, ever get dive business, I think it's, uh, I'm sorry, um, divecenterbusiness.com? They will send out to, if you own a store, they'll get you that stuff, Dive Center Business. I always answer their, um, their surveys, and this is where the data came from, on Dive Center Business. It's a great resource, by the way, it's a free resource, for those, I see some people writing it down. If you wanna know statistics and data, go to Dive Center Business. And that's what this, and they have, every couple years, they run a thing out, what are air fill costs? And this is the numbers they came up with. It's a little bit tougher to read on the screen, but they broke it down actually by specific regions out there. So the air fill costs, and they went from air and nitrox, from low, high are the averages. The broken down numbers, so you can see a little bit easier. In 2005, the lowest price they saw was $2.50. $2.50 is all they were charging. The high end was $10. If we go to 2014, again, we now are nine years later, the low end has gotten lower. $2 for, is the lowest price they saw for an air fill. The highest one is at least is going up there by $15 onto it. So if we went ahead and figured out inflationary adjustments from 2005, the numbers we're looking at here, our low range should be $3.09. Just by keeping up with inflation with these crazy ass numbers that we have right there. Our current one right now is only $2. So we can't even keep up with ourselves and our industry to keep up with our inflationary costs of running the most expensive piece of equipment in our store. The higher range is keeping up there. Average high range should be $12.36. Average high range was $15. And the average was $6.14. And, oops, we're missing that part of the screen. It's $6.75 is the average. So if we're charging $6, that is the average nationwide on what the air fill costs are. Everybody needs to set their own price. I would challenge everybody in this room to say that we might want to go ahead and be the lowest price to get the customers in our store, but that's not going to be the answer. Because who are we gathering into our stores? Those people who don't want to pay that much more money onto it. And so the next slide, if we have this down of the average cost right now, should be $6.14, and we're running about $6.75, what does an air fill cost us? What's the true cost you have to incorporate into an air fill? Those things which we give away for free. <laughs> so different costs we have in an air fill. Number one, the cost of the compressor. I haven't been downstairs, but I'm just throwing out a lucky ass guess here. What, $15,000 to $20,000 for a high pressure compressor? So we get lucky, we find one used, a dive store went out of business. Okay, we're spending five or $6,000 for the initial purchase of that compressor system. Next thing, labor costs. Whether it's gonna be you, and let's say you, you're the owner, you still have to do, your time is valuable. What are you paying yourself or somebody else to go ahead and spend that 10 to 15 minutes doing the air fill? You have to factor that into it. So even if it's just 10, you're still looking at least two to three bucks of your time to fill up the cylinders in that rink. Electricity costs, depends on your region, how much you're gonna be spending electricity. Filters, if you keep your maintain your system out there, you're gonna be changing your filters out every 50 to 75 hours, maybe every 100 hours or so. And filters are running, what, $85 a piece now, multiple filters into the system. 
So every 100 hours or so, you're spending $160, which is going to be added to this cost. Fittings, fittings break down, you have to maintain them. And compressor maintenance. This compressor right here, all that happened onto it was the shroud loosened up, it hit the fan blade, and it broke apart. That's one of my compressors. That cost me $8,000 to repair because of a loose shroud onto the system. Those are the kinds of costs that you guys as store owners or those who are around fill station, those are the expenses that you've got to think about, but my guess is as well, that you guys haven't ever factored down all of those five different minor components of what it's going to actually cost you that air fill. So one of the main questions to ask yourself is, are you charging enough for your air fills? My guess is, if we factor those things in right now, just quick numbers in your heads, how much do you guys think we should be charging for an air fill? 15 and anybody else? I, I got 20 in my head. When I was running these numbers, like, what do I truly need to, I only charge 10. Why? And I'm the high, in my Northwest region, as far as I can tell with other shop owners, I am one of the highest paying. And in fact, that might be a little, a couple years back, we were hurting like everybody was. And I figured, this is, I figured out some of these costs, I raised it. We are the highest, and we actually were reported, you know, the news wire stuff, and they said, hey, we are the highest charging dinosaur for air. We didn't budge, we just stuck there the entire time. I, I actually saw, and I saw my numbers drop a little bit as far as certifications and costs, but the one thing, that one profitable item on my dive store, air fills. My air fills went up by 10%. Did I sell more air fills? No. But did my dollars increase because of that? Yeah, so I might have lost to two or three people or whatever I might have lost, but the fact that I raised my prices by $2, went ahead and made my bottom line a 10% increase when everything else was starting to do a slow decline onto that process. So the one thing, and the first thing I can tell you to do when you're talking about cylinders on here is you've got to take a look at what your true costs are and you can't cheat yourself out of those true costs of an air fill. Might you lose that one individual? Yeah, you might. They might go to the dive store down the road who's given a free air fill. So be it. But if you have and you maintain your systems and you have good air and good quality and all that kind of stuff, and you have good customer service, I would challenge you that that customer's gonna come back to you anyway. And as long as you're there and you're consistent and you're friendly, they're gonna come back and they're gonna spend that extra $10 to fill. And if you can, in fact, <clears throat> I don't know if it worked or not, but go buy a cheap air pump, a little air pump, you know, the for old fashioned one for your fill up of bicycle tires. And, when, and just a little thing, anybody who wants free air, here you go. Pump up your own thing. If you want the compressed air, if you want the high pressure air, then this is the cost. If you want it free, then you can go there. It's kind of a joke, it kind of, people giggled and laughed about it. But from that point on, nobody really asked us much about the price points. But you've got to let your customers know and you've got to let your staff know, these are the true costs. And they're not free and they're not $6. Yes? This is a business question. Mm -hmm. I'm asking another Mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at your costs that you have to do. Um, on the other side of the equation, when is enough enough? Okay. As far as raising the prices. Ask this question about the price of the fees, the mm -hmm. price of the training course. Obviously, we're in the business, we're professionals, if we're not making money, we're doing a disservice to the, to the profession. On the other hand, all this work in different communities, towns, and states, where the economy is different. So I guess at least on some level you have to ask the question, well, how much can I charge for a bill and still keep the door? And that's what I would answer that challenge with the fact that this is the one item which we, we are allowed to have the compressors, the component we have in place. At the same time, if you look at the overall values of BCs, regulators, dive trips, it's a very small amount of money. Somebody coming in your store is going to be a lot more willing to go ahead and place a $20 bill on the table to go and spend an hour of recreation versus spending $2,000 to go on a dive trip. And if you get some active divers in the area, those $20 fills, after 10 of them, is going to be 200 bucks. And it's not going to be as much profit, but you're looking at least a $100 profit range onto something like that over time versus having to discount a regulator or a BC along those lines, whatever it might be. And I'm not saying to suddenly raise it up, but at the same time, as we saw with the national averages and some of the people in this room, we are still in that mindset that we've got to keep our prices low. And if we keep our prices low, we'll get people into our store. But who are we gathering into our stores? And for those true people who come in, and they're our true customers, and we talk to them about it, we say, these are the costs I've got to deal with. And you, sometimes you can even tell a customer, and I'm fairly honest with mine, it's like, what do you think that compressor costs? $1,000? 
$1,500? Like, no, it's, it's a $20,000 compressor system. Oh my God, I didn't know there was that much. No, and I gotta maintain it, I gotta do those kinds of things. So this is what I've gotta, what I gotta charge you for. I've occasionally said if you buy a higher end item, I'll toss in a couple air fill cards for you, but it's always a quid pro quo kind of a scenario on that. What do you think about the incentives of 10, you know, nine air fills, 10 flints free or something, the air fill card? Air fill, we do those as well. But I read a book once on trying to figure out how to make the money, and the guy says every time that you give a 10% discount, so let's say you save somebody $20, you've got to sell $40 to make up for the $20 you gave away. So when you want to discount something, you've got to be very, very cautious about it. And the one thing that we've got that's going to hold the people account is they've got to come and get air fills from us. And at least that's the one item we've got that we can at least maybe maintain this end of it and then go from there to hopefully sell them some other products which we can maybe compete with online. It's the thing, but I think what it comes down to for us in the room, and I'm assuming I've been, I've been in the same place as you guys have been, where you're like, God, if I raise that price, I'm gonna lose somebody. I did that challenge. I did it, I stuck to my guns, and that's the one profitable item I have in my store for this past year, was my air fills. So just keep that in mind, and it might be worth the challenge. Factor these things out, think about it, see if the customer, see if it's worthwhile, see if enough is not enough. So do a baby challenge, raise it by a buck 50. Do that. If there's a tax in your state, Put the price out so the tax comes up to an exactly, let's say you charge $6, but with tax it comes to whatever. Well, maybe raise the price to $8.43 and with tax it comes to 10. Something like that, but give it a baby's up and I think you'll be surprised that you're gonna get the positive response back. You'll get some grumblings, don't get me wrong. But the grumblers, if you simply have that joke, little air pumps, they will, you can get, I can get your air from there. At least they'll, they'll do whatever, but they'll probably still buy the air and they'll move on from that point in time. So it's just a something for you to think about. The next thing you can do, you have to try to reduce some of your costs that you're gonna have out there. Some of the costs, one thing I would recommend is a maintenance log for the compressor system. Have, train your staff on when the oil has been changed, when the filters have been changed. Um, if the belts are, are making a rattly noise. The one thing I told my staff, when it makes a funny sound, you don't know what it is, you don't keep running the compressor, you shut it down. But they don't know that. And, if you, and the one who kept running, well then that, you saw the results from previously. Because I heard this funny sound before I heard this big bang. Well, why didn't you shut it down? I didn't know I had to. Shut it down afterwards. So it's a maintenance log. Um, I have a website, cylindertrainingservices.com, a little bit of a self-plug. But on I put a free maintenance log. It's an Excel sheet. It's nothing fancy. But if you don't want to create your own, you go to the website, download the thing, and then you can, what I've done with mine is when I open the door to the compressor room, I have that maintenance log sheet on there. The staff has to sign it. I know the staff's not checking the compressor. When I go to that door and there's nothing written on that log sheet because they haven't, I know they've gone in the room, they had to have, they had to turn the compressor on, but they didn't sign the log sheet. I know they aren't maintaining the compressor systems and I can talk to them about something like that. So just a way to do a checks and balance on to them. The other one, the final pressures the final pressure that you're gonna run your compressors to. The, manu the um, cylinder um, manufacturer going to higher pressures. Um, high pressure steels is a very popular, up, at least up in the Northwest, 3,500 PSI. Even though you have a compressor which runs to 5,000 PSI, the higher you run a compressor over 3,000 PSI, the more wear and tear that you're gonna get on that compressor system. In my rental fleet, I have low pressure systems, 2,400 PSI. My compressor doesn't ever go above 2,400 PSI. I've reduced my four stage rebuilds almost in half because I don't run up that high. If a customer wants a high pressure system, 3,500, I charge them an extra dollar. If they ask why the extra dollar, because it creates more wear and tear and it's gonna cost me a lot more money to repair that thing. 3,000. Generally the compressors will, will operate, they're per right along at 2,500 to 3,000 PSI, even a 5,000 maximum. The minute you start to jack it up a little bit and put more pressure on that four stage, it creates more wear and tear. Yes, it can go to five, but the higher you go with those pressures, the more often you have to replace those rings. Yeah, and so if you do that, if you're gonna find out, if you were to go ahead, and I'll give you another suggestion, but if you can keep that final pressures down a little bit lower onto it, it's gonna maintain your, your compressor you need less maintenance. But I'm not, we don't have that ability. Everybody's doing high pressure systems. So think about, we talked about increasing their price, add an extra dollar or so for the high pressure um, cylinder fills. It takes a lot more pressure and a lot more wear and tear on it. And it's great that the cylinder manufacturers have a, a smaller cylinder, it's at a certain price point, hey great, go buy it. And it looks really sexy, people wanna buy them. But the minute you see the 3500 PSI mark, you as the owner of that compressor, you better just go, oh, shit, <laughs> I'm screwed. 
you know, is this gonna go ahead and cost you guys down the road? It's something to keep in mind, maybe when it comes to your rental fleets and all. Yes, it's small and it's stock and it's great for the smaller individuals out there, but higher pressure is a lot more money. And my rental fleet, I lock everything down to the 2400 PSI cylinders and my compressors per ride along and I saw my maintenance go down drastically because I'm not running those higher numbers onto it. So the higher pressure, more wear and tear. Charge, I just charge a buck more onto it. And that might be something where I'll give them the freebie. If it's a regular customer and they bought this, I'm not gonna do it. But somebody who comes in and they want a set of doubles filled to those higher numbers and it takes more time to do that, then obviously you're gonna have that issue. And eh. It gives you some little bit of a wiggle room to go ahead and play with on that. Another option which some people never thought about is a booster system. If you buy an either air powered or an electronic booster. The way I run my system is I have my storage banks. My storage banks never see above 2,500. That's the maximum onto them. Something brings me a high pressure cylinder. I go to an air booster, which run about 1,500 bucks. You can go high end to an electric one for like $7,000. But then I use anything above 2,400 I use on my booster system. A booster, if you want to repair the booster, if it breaks down, 100 bucks. But that booster is designed and works more efficiently to take those higher pressure from 24 to 3,500. It takes a little bit longer, but the wear and tear saved on your high pressure compressor systems is phenomenal. Once I've done that again, I can't, in fact, I was thinking the last time I had to do a repair on my four stage on the compressors, and it's been God, six months once I went over to the boosting kind of a system. So you're investing in the money under the booster, but the booster's taking that 2,400 supply pressure, and it's giving you the, the, the 3,000s or the 3,500s, but it'll pump 3,000, 3,500 all day long. And it's not, and the, when the rings blow on that, 30 bucks. And it's a one component system, so it's a lot easier to rebuild without a lot of downtime onto it. So the booster is a good way. If you do a lot of high pressure fills or you're seeing a lot of maintenance costs in your compressors, like, man, why am I spending so much money? Think about a booster component and keeping those final pressures down to a much more manageable level. Um, adjusting time between the filters. If you go and check with Lawrence Factor, the rest of them, they'll give you a price. You know, every 50 hours, change out your filters. Open up your filters, manage or monitor the actual um, usage of them, and maybe like with mine, I can go about 78 hours in my environment before I have to go and do the filter changes. You can follow exactly what the manufacturers say every 50, but the manufacturers don't know your environment. If you have a very moist environment, then you might have to change them out more often. If it's an arid, dry environment, maybe you can double the lifespans on those things. But you start to understand what the filters do before you go ahead and simply change the time because it's 50 hours and they said to change them every 50 hours. It depends upon its use and how much water they've actually absorbed into the systems. The other one, and I forgot to put a picture up, so let me see if I can describe it to you guys correctly. And I learned this from a guy from Lawrence Factor. When you're coming off the compressor, you're going to your two, your two filter stacks. He's with me so far. You have two filter stacks, maybe the charcoal or the desiccant, whatever. From the compressor, when it first enters that filter stack, you can go to Global downstairs, and they have a little bit of a bleeder screw, but it has a little port on the end of it. Put that port right before the filter stacks. What happens is the water's going through your filtration system. It's going to sit down there and pool on the bottom. The more the water pools, the more it's going to go ahead and add into your filters, and it's going to go ahead and consume them a little bit faster. If you add one more bleeder screw right before that filtration stack and you bleed it off occasionally, you're going to be surprised how much water shoots out. That water being shot out is going to go ahead and not go into the filters, which is going to extend your filter's life onto it. So there's one more bleeder spot. You've got your ones on your compressor, which either go off automatically or you do it manually. But the next one, what you want to do is, is right before the filter stacks, and again, Global sells them. It's just a high pressure fitting and it's just a bleeder screw and just bleed off some moisture right before that filter stack as it accumulates. And then that's gonna probably increase your usage time by at least five to 10 hours, which will give you a little bit more money and in the long run it's gonna save you quite a bit of money. Oh. Uh, the ones they sell, are they all manual? Or it's, a, it's, a, it's only a manual. You can, by the way, you can buy the um, automatic ones. I've done that. It's like 400 bucks and they're, they're tricky little bastards to figure out. But so I, all I do is I just go in there and I, it's not that you do it all the time, it's just that little extra moisture which gets shot out that's not gonna go into the filters. But you can buy them, but they're about $400 for the high pressure ones, but Global has just the manual turn ones, and that's gonna go ahead and extend the life of your filters. Can you add an inline filter? I suppose this would depend a lot on the compressor. But can you add another filter to the, the factory filter on yours? On the compressor itself? You'd have to talk to the manufacturer on that because there's so many different components. Go long, as far as you know? Is that a practice the filter on the compressor itself, like an extra bleed system? No, an extra filter instead, instead of your air going through one filter, it goes through like two filters. Like two, like a, an air filter and a moisture filter and a charcoal filter? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, all the time. In fact, there's a place here, one of my clients, down here, they have 16 <laughs> that they go through before it actually goes on the outside. I think it's a little bit overkill, but. Yeah, you can go through as many filters as you want. And it's not gonna affect it, but just, yeah. I'd probably say two to three, it depends on your environment. Like up in the Northwest, we have two moisture filters because we have so much moisture. Maybe if you have an issue with some odors, then yeah, then switch it over to maybe or charcoal. But you can put as many filters as you want onto them, and they will gladly sell them to you. Onto it. Um, so, Jane. So, next thing to do is your cost of your cylinder inspections. I'm assuming everybody in here does cylinder inspections. Yeah, most of you, I get most of the head nods on. Same question you're going to ask yourself as the air fills. How much do you charge? How much time does it take? How much time have you spent in training classes on cylinder stuff? Tools. Track the inspections, how do you track them? How do you get the customer to come back in your store? How do you go ahead and try to make money on something which we take it as a, we interpret it as a law. We have to have these annual inspections, which by the way, it's not, but that's what we do to keep ourselves safe onto it. But all the divers wanna come into our store on a regular basis, do these inspections. But for us to do them, it's not free. It's not just sticking a light in, there's all the investments that you gotta factor out into what you wanna charge for something like that. One thing I have developed and it's on the back table, it's a free of charge, it's a way to monitor your inspections, and it's a way to get the customers back into your store. If you go to the website, cylindertrainservice.com, on the you log in, you can then track every one of your inspections that you do. If they're in-house, great, they're in-house so you know when to inspect your in-house cylinders. If they're an outside customer cylinder, you put their data on there, including their email or their text. When you put in the reminder on that, you put the reminder down to it, your customer gets notified that their cylinder's due for inspection to come back to your facility to go and get the inspection done. You also send an email to remind you to maybe contact the customer and have them come in and do the inspection process onto it. It's free of charge. I put some little um, pamphlets on the back table, so pick one up as you go around. And it is free because all I want you to do is come to my website. I sell tools there, so that way you can have it. But the, one of the main reasons I developed it was I had no, when my staff would do an inspection, I have piles and piles of paper. I couldn't figure out when customer was due, when I just hoped they would come back at some point in time and maybe come and revisit my shop. But if we were to go in there and we had a system set up that I reminded them to come back in, we always got that cylinder to come in and that created more business for us onto it. So this system is designed that you guys can track your own cylinders, track your customers, and send them a reminder to come back to your shop to go and get the inspection done down the road onto it. Other thing I came up with, whoops, excuse me. Yeah, it's cut off. Um, but I came up with a menu. Another problem I came up with with my customers and my staff. People drop off something, yeah, I need this inspected. Okay, great, we're gonna inspect it. But what are we inspecting? We've got the valves, we've got burst discs, we've got tumbling, we've got whatever the case might be onto it. But the staff was never communicating with the customer what the options were. So all of a sudden a customer comes back and they, go, and they see a bill for 60 bucks. Well, what's $60 for? Well, we had to tumble, we had to do this. The customer was never informed. I'd be ticked off myself. So what we came up with, and by the way, if anybody wants this, email me at my names all over on the back pamphlet. I can send it, I'll be happy to share this with you. We actually gave a menu, so now when the customer comes in the store, my staff says, here's the menu, what do you want? And they go down and say, well, let me see, well, I want the inspection, and what's this valve thing? Well, if we want to redo your valve, I want the valve, and, and the tumble's like, I don't, hold off in the tumble, we'll see about that, and I maybe want this done, and at the end of it, the customer knows exactly what their charge is. Generally, the charges are running about 30% more than they were before, because they're asking for more service to be done, and the client, the customer, knows exactly what they're gonna want, what they're gonna pay for, and they're asking for more things. Because they don't understand what you guys can do during an inspection process. They don't know that you can rebuild a valve. They don't know that you can tumble. They don't know that you can clean. They don't know that you can do these things. But it gives them a menu that they check off what they want, and when they come back later on, you know what they wanted, they know what they're paying for, and it keeps the communication going a lot better on that one. And I'll talk about some of these things here in a little bit, which is the rebuild of the valves. Does anybody ever make it a standard practice to rebuild the valves on all cylinders? We generally pop off the valve, we look inside, we do the inspections on the threads, we put it back on and off we go. It's generally how. If you aren't doing the valves, you're losing a lot of money. You don't have to go ahead and do a complete total rebuild on a valve if you don't wish to. We offer the customers three choices. Do you want your valve lubricated? Throw some lubrication onto it. Five bucks, we go and we do the high pressure seat and do some basic thing. Do you just want us to clean it up? I mean, we're not going to replace anything, but we're going to clean it through. And if there's a bad O-ring, we'll replace a bad O-ring, but that way we'll lubricate it and clean it for you. Or you want a complete total rebuild. The stem's been bent, and, this is, and those are three different price structures. And like any marketing strategy, I'm just like, oh, hmm, I have a, I'll take the low choice. Where before, if you were going to be doing something like that, you wouldn't charge them a dime. But now you're getting five bucks just to lubricate the valve, which is something which you can take the valve apart in, what, three minutes? 
puts the location, put it back together again, but it's on the menu. The customer's not aware it's an option for you on something like that. Um, uh, kind of off the side, but even on, on cylinder valves, if they're not working correctly, people can be harmed by the cylinder valves. If they can't turn it off or they're bent stems or different things along those lines. And the diver will never go ahead and maintain it until it's too late or there's going to be a problem with the valve. So you guys as an inspection agency need to go ahead and make that as an option to them. If they don't want to pay it, that's fine. But at least if something were to occur and the valve's not working correctly, it's not going to be upon you guys. You gave them that option to go ahead and do it. So when you're going to do something like that, so what is the, what's the average charge for? I was asked this most by people. What do you guys charge for an inspection on the cylinder? Anybody below $10? So 20, anybody above 20? What do you charge? Okay, any, any bitches about it or is it a? I combine my services. Mm -hmm. So you do a combination package, but you're getting 30, and you under $10 or less? But, so you do $5 for inspection. So is it because of the market? Or is it, now if I were to tell you, it's like, okay, fine, go to $10. With all the time, energy, money, do you think you'd lose that many people onto it? There's, there's other options, not borrowing. Yeah, but it might be one, so what you can do, and another suggestion, maybe go up to the $10, but offer them a written form. A lot of people will pay the 10 or pay five dollars, and they just use a stupid little sticker being slapped on the side. They don't understand that. If you can provide them with a written documentation of what you've done, and that's what the ten dollars is, use that free service. You give them; a, they get a printed copy, by the way. So you have to pay for that service, even though it's free. You have to pay, and the customer's not know, but it's giving them an added value for that additional money because five dollars. There's no way with your time, energy, you lose every time you do an inspection, you lose money. Same thing with the airfill aspect. So I'd say you, I think on the average one around the nation where I've been talking, about 20, 25 bucks. If you think about the amount of time, energy, tools, eh, it's, it's fair. But if now you add, do the added value, the rebuilds on the valve, now you're up to the $30 range. Now, and, and so what's it take to, to lubricate a valve? A minute or two, well worth your time. And now all of a sudden you're providing a service, the customers aren't complaining, you're giving them some written documentation, you're doing very little, but you are, for you, it almost be, what, my math sucks, what? Six times the amount of money that you'd be making in the past from five up to the thirty dollar range might be an option for you. My selling point on this, I think the valve is we're very close to Florida, so I have a pretty busy rental mm -hmm. And so I say, look, you don't want to have to call me in the middle of the night because it's just a case of someone who doesn't want to fill it because they don't like what they see on the on the sticker. Mm -hmm. So I tell them what is required in terms of what they need to see. Mm -hmm. and It's education onto it, but I think a part of it is we have to go ahead, and that's the other thing, by the way, which we can't buy from the internet. We can't do inspections on it. It's something which we've got to do, and we've got to have it, and we need to go ahead and self make ourselves um, a lot more reasonable for it. So the thing to keep in mind is what do you want to charge them on the valve? Again, three options. Just lubricate it, clean it in an ultrasonic cleaner, however you want to do it, or replace the parts onto it. And generally, when it goes to the replacement of the parts, and then you, with the kits nowadays, you're looking at $40, what's it costed to buy a new valve? Was going was it fifty five dollars now? I think for, if we went time to excess scuba and bought a valve, it's in like fifty five dollars or something. So maybe to the customer at that point, maybe they want to buy a new valve. Hey, maybe a new cylinder, one of those low pressure cylinders to help my compressor out. Kind of go down the chain and see what you want to do to get those things taken care of onto it. Place the components. So that's kind of all I've got on the dive store end of things, and I'll just end it with this: We don't charge enough for air fills. We need to charge more for airfills. We have way too much invested, and that's the one thing the internet can never take away from us, ever. We've got, just like if we went and operated a ski slope without a chairlift, it doesn't work. They don't pay us to ski down the slope. They don't pay us to use the snow. They pay us to get us up to the top. We need to give them pay charge for the air that the diver gets to go underneath the water. Without us, they can't go underneath the water. Same thing with the inspection process onto it. We need to go ahead and charge for the appropriate, we can't go crazy. It's not gonna, Marcus not going to bear the price points, but we can go ahead. And that's, by the way, when you were talking about the rental part, if somebody brings a cylinder to drop off, and doesn't work, I will give them a free rental. Hey, take the free rental, have a free air, just get this process taken care of. You know, I can get it. So I give them a little bit of a bone. It doesn't really cost me a lot. I get a good customer, good customer service, but I charge $30 in those, in those regards. So, um, Any questions on that? Now we're going to go into going outside the scuba industry. 
We just talked about, we don't charge enough, they don't want to pay enough, wah, all those different things. You need to take your skill set as experienced high pressure cylinder inspectors and high pressure cylinder filler operators out in the marketplace, whether it's going to be in the maritime industry, in the gas industries, in beverage, Coca-Cola, fire departments, all those things, people are out there and they don't know a damn thing what they're doing. All they get is money tossed at them and they don't know what to do with the process. So there are numerous types of cylinders that need to be inspected. Aluminum cylinders. We have, think about how many cylinders are in a hospital and they need to be inspected. Anybody who deals with a cylinder, anything over 29 PSIG, needs to be trained in hazmat. I'll talk about it later, but you guys had the ability to train somebody in hazmat if you had to. You've got some of the skill sets behind it. The beverage industry, like I mentioned, that NFPA conference, when they're talking about how many cylinders they have to look for and the people that they have to train, they're talking to hundreds if not thousands of employees and hundreds of thousands of cylinders, which by the way, they have injuries and issues and explosions occurring in the industry as well. So we're talking scuba, O2 cylinders, beverage. This was just one factory and they don't, as a scuba, they didn't even know what, they knew what scuba was, but they just ignored it because they were making way too much money in the other industries and in welding, whatever it might be. Steel cylinders, storage bottles, scuba obviously, fire suppression companies. There are multi-million dollar companies that go and put fire suppression companies out. They have to go ahead and install these cylinders, which go above 29 PSIG. Their employees who install this equipment need to be properly trained in hazmat and those cylinders need to be inspected. I had a company who called me up and said, yeah, I need to train my, ins the fire inspection. my guys install fire suppression system. I need your training. It's like, okay, and what are we looking for? So I talked to them a little bit. And when I go out there, what they were told was, we just, we don't know anything. By the NFPA standards, we have to learn how to inspect these cylinders, but we don't know what we're looking for. In their industry, they don't have an idea what corrosion looks like. They put in a multi-million dollar system and they walk away from it. But when they go out and do the inspections, they don't know what they're inspecting. They also don't realize that they have to go and sign off different forms that have been properly trained in this kind of stuff. So it's a new market area that's out there that if anybody deals with a high pressure system, they need the training or the inspections. That might even be something for you guys if you can hook up with a fire suppression company and they go do inspections on, on cylinders and different things is, hey, I'm trained, I've got the certification, here I am, no matter which agency you're with, I've got the certification. You can then go and market yourself as the inspector. What are you checking for? Corrosion on the outside. Do you guys know what corrosion looks like? Yeah, you've probably seen, you probably tell stories. These other people aren't aware of it. They don't know what to do that, but they need to have inspectors. They need to be properly trained and you guys hold the certification for things like that. But the trick there is who is that individual? And that's something which if you look up at National Fire Protection, NFPA, in there they have an entire document on, on fire suppression. There's an entire conference which goes on just in fire suppression cylinder stuff. And it's multi-million dollar corporations that all they want to do is get their people trained so they don't get fined. The average fine right now is $469 per person per day if they're not properly trained or they're not doing the inspections properly. They're trying to avoid those areas. We have some experience in that area, so that's an option for us. And the biggest one that's coming out now is composite cylinders. That's the money maker. The composite cylinders where all the manufacturers are going. Catalina's gonna open up their new plant here next week. I'm sorry, not, sometime this year, very soon onto it. Composite cylinders, when you go out there and you go into these factories onto them, is huge money making. The manufacturers, Luxfer, Catalina, Worthington, don't make squat on scuba divers. Matter of fact, we put Press Steel out of business because of the money we wouldn't spend on it. So what are the manufacturers doing to make money? Composites. They're trying to put them into the dive industry. Problem with composites in the dive industry is they don't quite work as well. Buoyancy issues and a lot of other concerns like that, but there's one or two. Also it's the cost. A stand, those are rather large ones. Firefighter bottles, where the firefighters wear on their backs. What's the cost of one of those? What's the fire department pay for that thing on, their, on one firefighter's back? Just a cylinder. Any guesses? They wish. A thousand. One thousand to twelve hundred dollars per cylinder. Fire departments generally order in bulks of one hundred, if not one thousand cylinders at a shot. All it takes to go and condemn that cylinder? One man down drill, one piece of chemical exposure on that, and that cylinder is gone. They gotta go buy a new one. That's really what it comes into. In the, in the vehicle industries right now, compressed natural gas in the box of vehicles, they also have composite cylinders. They have to be inspected every 36,000 miles. If somebody has to go in there and take a look at them. Yet if you go talk to the manufacturer, well, who goes ahead and who does this? Who, who, who can teach? They don't know. Because the manufacturers, because what do the manufacturers tell them to do? Buy a new one. I want, I want another $1,000, I want another $10,000 thing. They don't teach them that you can actually take those cylinders, you can inspect them and you can actually repair them. But they need to have those kinds of aspects onto it. 
Something like in the in the, the vehicle end of things is a very, very tight market. It's tough for us to get into. But how many of you fill cylinders for your local fire departments? Anybody ever fill them? I do for my volunteer. I, I do offer free air fills to my fire departments. It's, it's a, it's a, do you have experience with fire departments? Mm -hmm. Just by filling it as a dive, dive store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's why I offer them. I fill up their O2 bottles for free, and I fill up their, their composite zones for free. And when they come through, we go and we start talking about the maintenance and the training and the training. True, but at the same time, when you have this thing, if you're offering them those services and they're coming to you for air fills and you're walking through some of those processes, you're going to open that door. And there, is a, there are numerous fire department companies, and all of the people do, that they're generally retired fire as they go around from fire department to fire department, and they inspect the exterior of all the composites, and they make sure they've been inspected correctly, and they fill the cylinders. They basically walk around with traveling compressor systems. They check the cylinders, and generally they'll get about 35 to 40 bucks per cylinder. And when they go into the fire departments, they don't get 10. They get 100 to 200 to 300 cylinders at a shot, and all they're doing, they're checking the outside of the, of the composite cylinders is all they're doing. Why? The fire departments don't want to mess with it. Only the fire department knows that they've got to get a hydro test every five years but they go through a lot of abuse in that five-year period. So there are numerous companies out there. Um, Brian mentioned earlier, the FDIC show. Um, I don't remember what it stands for, um, but the fire, largest fireman show in the United States. And they have all these cylinders up there, and you talk to everyone, and they don't want to mess with their cylinders. They say something they don't want to worry about. You guys can go and just talk to your local fire departments and do their inspections, their, at least their external inspections on their composite cylinders. As far as filling up their scuba cylinders at the fire departments? Yeah, it's a, I mean, dive teams do it all the time. So if they have an access to a compressor, they have access to the compressor. But what your angle is going to be is to go into those fire departments. SCBAs are filled with 4,500. 4,500? Oh, minimums. Mm -hmm. Some of, the new ones coming out are six grand. In fact, 3,000 is pretty low, pretty basic form. Yeah. Well, they, they can handle it, but at the same time, they have different inspection techniques. But that's something to keep in mind is local fire departments are a huge source of income for you guys if you inspect their cylinder because they don't want to mess with it or even the potential of the filling of those cylinders, but it's some money for you. And generally, they've got the government, they've got tax dollars, and they don't quibble or, or fight or argue about how much money they want to spend for something. And that's where it comes into you guys. If you guys can answer your own questions here. How many cylinders do you own? How many do you handle? Experience with boosters, like high pressure gas you guys do on a daily basis. So on then, so what's the difference between selling a high pressure air cylinder, an O2 bottle, a fire department SBA, or a military egress cylinder? None, zero, there's no difference. Yeah, we said, like, yeah, we're, I was so shocked by even with the military coming to me, because I'm near a military base, I'm lucky, but they don't know squat. They get $80,000 to buy a compressor that they can't operate. I charged them and I went and I taught them how to operate it. Hey, this is the button you push, this is how you do it. Okay, and they paid because they just don't get it. But it's just a matter of asking those questions when it comes in because there's huge money and they don't argue about the processes. Hydro facilities, another option for you. Um, for those of, has anybody ever thought about opening up a hydro test facility? It's an option. Um, these are some numbers a friend of mine gave me. Actually, um, I did hydro test products. I think they're in booth uh, uh, 5050 in the middle part. They put together an entire pamphlet on becoming a hydro tester. And what they do, if you guys want the products, they're listing, by the way, for those of you who are curious, they will get you set up as a hydro test facility for, if I can find their sheet of paper here. I have it, I promise, they showed it to me. Here we go, their total amount of money, 11,450. That's what, but you have to pay for your training on top of that. So my friend who's a hydro tester, she goes, yeah, you're gonna spend quite a bit, depends on what kind of level you want, but that is an option for to go ahead and, and make some extra money as a hydro, but you are going into a whole other realm. But the good news is you're going to the realm such as fire industries, uh, fire extinguishers, paintballs, all those kinds of things, which is a huge benefit to you. It's an option, but it's an investment. You're looking at $12,000 plus. The real drawback is you're gonna have the DOT that's gonna come and do some inspections on you, and their fines aren't cheap if you make a mistake. So it's good and bad on the hydro test facility. 
So you want to inspect all the different cylinders out there. And we're talking about all cylinders. If you walk down the street, look at the amount of cylinders that you're going to have walking down the street. Aircraft, and all those kinds of things. There's a number of them that are going to be down there for you. Firefighting, refineries, fire suppression systems, aviation, welding. They all handle high pressure cylinders. High pressure cylinders have to be properly inspected. The OSHA requires that there's an inspection protocol if they own a high pressure cylinder. You guys can help develop that protocols for them. You need a document, you need to come up with a system. Say, this is the train, this is what I've done, all those kinds of things. And email me. I'll be happy to walk you through some of the basics onto it. You just have to develop the system which they have to follow, because if they don't follow it, they're talking $465 per person per day in fines, just for lack of training on those kinds of stuff. Gas fills, heliums, carbon dioxides, O2s, boosters, all those kinds of things which you guys deal with on a regular basis, expand it beyond. Think about the uh, medical companies around you, different people who may be um, helium, even we have a local store and they do helium balloons. We supply them with the helium and we get a little profit onto it and then it just kind of expands our marketplace onto them. On the composite cylinders, onto it, nice thing about a composite cylinder, it's not internal, it's all external. We aren't concerned about the internal components on the composites, all external, which makes your job a little bit easier. You don't take the valves off. In fact, I strongly discourage you to take the valves off a composite cylinder. Compressed natural gas. And even in the military, this is a military aviation composite system. It runs them $15,000. They got a couple hundred of them. They don't know what to do with them. They take them out to training grounds and they fill cylinders with that. It's just a, tr a fill transfer system using a composite cylinder. But they don't know about the cylinders, they don't know how to fill, they don't know about the transferring kind of stuff. But pretty much every military base with an aviation unit has those, because they have to have them, but they don't know how to operate them. They don't know how to fill them. They're afraid to fill them. You guys would have that opportunity to go out there and say, yep, this is a composite cylinder, this is how the transfer fill process works, and you put something together for them, if that's what they wanted to go ahead and do, because they don't have a clue. But they'll spend $15,000 on two cylinders on a transfill whip, which we spend 150 bucks on, they'll spend 15,000 for something like that. The basic hazmat training, that's going to be the foot in the door. You can go out and provide some basic hazmat training. You can put together a program to tell people the dangers of high pressure cylinders. You have that ability. You have to go and follow certain protocols. You have to have you know, a documented um, what the course is and, and, and who you are and things like that and provide a certificate. But the government doesn't specify who that needs to be. So that's an opportunity for you as you can take your knowledge and, and describe that to people around you at the hazards of filling a high pressure cylinder onto it. There are very specific training requirements on them, but the thing is anybody who's exposed to a high pressure cylinder needs to have the proper training. You guys as well in your dive stores, but you can take your knowledge and take it beyond and go to all the other places who don't know about it. But it's a federal rule and regulation on there. Um, we're putting together through ITI a program, a hazmat, which we're hoping to offer for almost free. So you can go out and you can train these kinds of programs to make people aware of high pressure cylinders. We're working on it, so we'll, I'm sure with one of our blogs, we'll let you guys know when it's gonna be happening onto it. But all these places require hazmat training. Well, those hydro testers, dive teams, government, aviation, you name it, it requires it. So some of the teaching opportunities, another thing you can do is you can become an instructor. We teach you to become instructors through our training program. If you want to take the individual inspection procedure program, great. If you have training experience, you can get yourself up to an instructor level. You can go out and teach the fire departments on, that, on how to actually inspect their cylinders. You can take that upon yourself to go and expand your business knowledge. Nice thing is, it's everybody. I train open water students on how to inspect cylinders. Why the hell do you do that? Doesn't it take money away from you? Nope. I, took, I had a commercial harvest company near me. I taught them how to inspect their 100 cylinders. I taught their three students. I provided them with all their equipment. Nine months later, they were back in my shop. Hey, can you inspect our cylinders? Like, well, why? I, mean, I, just, I just did this for you. Pain in the ass. I don't want to do it anymore. And they just moved on because they don't want to do the process. They'll invest into it. It sounds good, but they don't want to follow through with that process. Same thing with open water students. They just want the knowledge. They want to know what goes on. Walk them through the knowledge. Teach them how to do it. Trust me, it's not going to take business away from you if you teach them how to inspect their cylinders. Military, government, dive clubs onto it. Um, the one thing about our program that we've got, <clears throat> it is a, it's an insured program. If you go through the one through SDI and you follow the simple protocols in place and you go teach somebody, they make a mistake onto it, it's a $2 million liability policy. We're backing our program with over $2 million bucks onto it. So it's something which if you were to go out there and follow our protocols, it will help protect you and we'll have your back on something like that. Um, just some end notes on here. If you guys are interested in taking an inspection course, we have one tomorrow all day long. I know everybody's busy at Demon, but if you have a free day tomorrow, nothing to do, look us up at the, at the booth. We can sign you up for our class. We have an instructor course um, Friday morning. 
Um, and then we also have an instructor meeting. And what we're doing this year is we're updating our, our program. Every three years we update it. And what do we do? We get all of our instructors together in a room and we say, how do we want to change our program? What needs to be updated or changed or moved around onto it? And then this is just my basic information and our booth number in case you have any questions. And I think I have five minutes if there's any questions that haven't been asked yet onto it. So any questions at all? I did it. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We all have. Um, you know, I, like a lot of people, train for PSI. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe you and I need to get together some I need to ask some questions about who really runs the show when it comes to this type of stuff. Nobody. That's Nobody does. The U.S. government simply says you have to have a training program in place. That's really what it comes down to. What have we done? We've made a program that's useful, I think, to most people. we made it productive, and we also back it with insurance. And it's going to be a little bit, but nobody runs it. The U.S. government will not endorse anybody. They simply say, have these protocols in place. You have them in place, you're good to go. So, but we can discuss that more, more later on if you'd have it. But if you have any questions, um, you can email me. Um, at the same time, when you're leaving, I did put on the back that free um, way to inspect the cylinders. Um, I think it's going to be a great way to track it, and at the same time, it's going to get customers back into your store. And if you do anything, raise your air prices and raise your inspection prices, because that's the only thing that we don't have to compete with with the internet. That's the only way we keep ourselves alive. Okay? Thank you.